encyclopedia of all things rock and metal. and metal, Eddie Trunk. Okay, we're back. Always great to have Geezer Butler with us and uh, hanging out here in Vegas with me. Uh, thank you so much, Geese, for taking some time out. I appreciate it. I know you're not busy at all, apparently, because you're retired. That's it's not right. not like you have anything else to do. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get a few phone calls on for uh, for Geezer. This is Ryan in Minnesota who is going to kick us off. Hold on. I just need to reboot my phones here to make sure this is working right. And D Ryan, are you there? Hey, Eddie and Geezer. It's actually Brian in Minnesota. But uh, uh, Brian. Go ahead, Brian. Great great to be on with you, Geezer. Um, before I ask my question, I, I got to tell you, 26 years ago, when I was an up-and-coming uh, young uh, radio jock myself, you were one of my very first interviews, and you were very gracious to talk to then, and you're always a pleasure to see live and listen to. So thank you again for doing that 26 years ago. Um, oh, thank you, Brian. For you, well, yeah, thank you, thank you, man. It, it, it was great. I mean, like I said, it was one of my first interviews, and you, you couldn't have been a better person to talk to. Um, my question for you today is talking about uh, Black Sabbath and the Heaven and Hell project with Ronnie. Um, what would you have seen in the future for that if Ronnie hadn't unfortunately passed away at the time that he did? Um, well, I think uh, Ronnie was about to do um, another solo album, and then we were talking about uh, doing something after uh, his solo album. Yeah, he had, he was working on uh, I think another Magica, which is what he which there was because there's one song that was done actually, and uh, that that's what I know he was working on at the time. Uh, let's let's say hello to Ray, who's in New York, joining us now. Hey, Ray. Hey, Geezer, how are you, sir? Uh, first of all, um, I got to tell you, I'm a bass player, and up next to you, I sound like a third grader playing. So, thank you for that. Appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, question lyrically, and you know, the way mar they marketed Sabbath was a very evil, dark band, but lyrically there was a lot of spirituality in there, a lot of it being positive. In fact, uh, Striper even covered your song, uh, After Forever, I believe. Um, I'm curious as to the background of those lyrics spiritually, where they came from, if you held to a certain faith or still do. Uh, well, I was brought up very, very strict Catholic, um, he is really wearing a shirt that says Hail Satan, by the way. I'm not making that up when he uh, walked in. And then I talked to the dark side. <laughs> Turned to the dark side. No, I was brought up in a very strict Catholic. I used to love going to church and mass. Um, and so, obviously, that I really believed in Satan and all that kind of crap. Um, and so that sort of went over to uh, the lyrics that I wrote. Right, After Forever was... Uh, probably the most Christian song that's ever been. Um, mm. It was based on all the, uh, the sectarian violence in Ireland, Northern Ireland. Uh, my parents were from Ireland, uh, and so it really affected me to uh, see P Protestants and Catholics killing themselves, killing each other over uh, the same kind of belief. Where, what what uh, was it? The news and the stuff that was happening in the seventies that inspired your lyrics. Was, did a, did a, what was a lot of it when you sat down to write? Was it challenging for you to write lyrics? Were you kind of did Not you go into it begrudgingly? No, no I was uh, very poetic when I was a kid. When okay. I was at school, I was really good at English language and English literature. Um, so it was just part of. Uh, where I was into, I was and and the the inspiration for it, and the th the things that shaped your lyric writing, whether it was religion or the news of the day at the time, that's really what the the Sabbath songs are are about. At there that was anti-war, uh, all the stuff that was going on in Vietnam and all that. Um, my brothers had been drawn into the Suez Canal War, uh, and I saw that what the effect that that had on my mom. So, what's Iron? What are the where the lyrics from Iron Man come from? It was sort of uh, based on Jesus Christ. I never put that together. Yeah, it's like this guy that goes and does good, and then he comes, uh, he's trying to spread the word, and uh, ends up being crucified for telling the truth. 
and that was like Iron Man coming, seeing the future, coming back to tell the world how horrible it's going to be, and um, and people turn against him. But in, like, whereas Jesus like died to save people, Iron Man takes his revenge, and that's that's the biggest difference. Is he live or dead? The first lyric in the song. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. All right. Let's say hello to. Uh, Chad in South Carolina, because I'm just trying to move quick because we have limited time here. Chad, go ahead. You're on with Geezer. Hey, Geezer. i got to say it is just an honor to get to talk with you. One of my all-time favorite bands is Sabbath, so thank you for all that you've done. Cheers, uh, Chad. Hey, thanks. Uh, my quick question is, so my brother, he is an aspiring bass player, and he also looks up to you as uh, one of his many influences. So my question is, what kind of advice would you give for aspiring bass players today? Um, just stick with it. I mean, but it's, it's, it's uh, hard to uh, progress on your own. So as long as he plays to get a drum machine or something like that, that can improve your playing. To have something to play to or along with uh, can improve. Uh, and just practice every day. Keep practicing and practicing and practicing. All right, Chad. Thank you for the call. Do you play guitar much? Keys still just for fun? Yes. You do? Yeah, because it's hard to write stuff just on bass. Right. So, uh, yeah, I write most of the stuff on um, guitar. Here's Adam in Wisconsin on Live with Geezer Butler here on Trunk Nation. Hey, Adam. Hey, Eddie, and it's an honor to talk to you, Geezer. I've been listening to your music for years. I kind of went backwards in a way because my dad introduced me because he was a huge fan of the Heaven and Hell Mob Rules era. And then I kind of, because I always kind of took the Aussie stuff for granted, but the lyrics are still fantastic in those albums. Um, Thank so you. So it's an honor to talk to you. Um, what I wanted to ask about is uh, an album that doesn't get talked about it too much, but I think is fantastic, is uh, Cross Purposes, one of the Tony Martin era ones, or the only one that you ever really played on. Any good memories from that? I mean, I know it was kind of the contentious period for Sabbath, but I still think it's, there's some fantastic songs on there, like evil eye and the hand that rocks the cradle songs like that yeah it was one of the f the few albums where um i'd written a lot of the songs as well as tony because usually it was tony that wrote the music and i'd write the lyrics but on that album i think i wrote half of the music on there so that was a total change from usual you yeah, good adam i think it's fun I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, no, I said, are you good? Oh, Did you yeah. have a follow-up? Are you good? Uh, no, just uh, sing your praises. And I'm also a bass player, too, but I'm a, I'm a plectrum player. I Every time I try to play, like, Lady Evil or any of the stuff with with Ozzy, like Hand of Doom, my hand always cramps up. So you're the master, man. <laughs> Cheers. Thanks. Adam, take care. Do you, as you've gotten older, is it is it more challenging to play the way you play? Is it is there? Do you have problems with your hands, your fingers, anything? I mean, that happens a lot with drummers, I know, and some musicians. Their um, arm, their elbow, their shoulders. You have ever no, problems? Not, not really, no. That's good. I mean, the, the only problems I have is whizzing around the stage like like I used to. Right. And I would just stand there and play. In all the lyrics that you've written on all the Sabbath stuff. When, was there ever a time where you presented them to Ozzy and he looked at them and he said, what the fuck are you writing about? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Is there one that jumps, one, one or two stories, one or two stories that jumps out where you had to sit down with him and Oof. say, no, oh, this is how you got to phrase it. This is what we're going for. No, he does all the phrasing and everything like that, but I, I, I have to write the lyric to the nth degree. Every tiny little syllable that it comes up with. <laughs> If the, if the word that I use is, is like two syllables and he's only singing one syllable, he won't <laughs> sing it. So you write it out phonetically almost? Would yeah, you? <laughs> you have to. Otherwise, you won't sing it. But uh, I always remember Paranoid, when I wrote par the lyrics to Paranoid. What's Paranoid mean? <laughs> <laughs> he didn't know what even Paranoid meant, no, the word. <laughs> it, it sang it, and like about two weeks later, and, what's Paranoid mean anyway? <laughs> Well, Zach once told Zach Wild once told me a story about um, about Mr. Crowley uh, because in, because in in Ozzy's solo career, as I'm sure you know, Bob Daisley was you. 
He, yeah. you know, Bob Daisley played all the bass and wrote all the lyrics. Yeah. So, so one time Zach told me a story, something about, uh, he was reading some story about the occult or something. And, and, uh, I think Bob Daisley wrote Mr. Crowley about Aleister Crowley or something. Right. Yeah. And, and, and Ozzy goes, I was reading a book or something. Aleister Crowley goes, what is that rubbish about? And Zach goes, that's the guy you've been singing about <laughs> for 40 years. <laughs> and he said, oh, this Mr. Crowley had no idea. <laughs> Oh, God, it's too funny. All right, we got to take a quick break here, and we'll come back. We'll have a few more minutes with the great Geezer Butler, 844-686-5863. Squeeze in a few more calls here on Trunk Nation. Coming right back after this. Trunk Nation. Let me listen to this. With Eddie Trunk. You didn't know you needed it, but now you do. Sirius XM Volume. Do you ever have any time to take a breath and enjoy the experience? Trunk Nation. I'm so focused on being 100% for the gig that I don't do anything. Not serious because Eddie Trump. All right, a few more minutes left to go here with Geezer Butler live from Vegas today here on Trunk Nation. The big NFL draft is uh, today, Geezer. You got any interest in that? Uh, absolutely none. You went to the uh, Super, Bowl. Super Bowl, though, right? Yeah. I yeah. saw some photos. So you like sports. You Oh, yeah. You yeah. don't care about the draft, but you watch. You're a uh, Rams fan, right? Yeah. Because of when they were, because your ties Louis. to St. Louis, right? Yeah. And the Cardinals, and that's that's pretty Cardinals, much your sports yeah. allegiance, right? Yeah. And the, but but soccer or uh, British, football. yeah, European football is your thing. What's Absolutely. your team again? Aston Villa. And who, who else in Sabbath was a fan of that team? Nobody was like me because I, I bleed it. Uh, Ozzy occasionally went there. Tony occasionally went there, but nobody's a fanatic like I am. So is there a, was there a compete? Who, who's the biggest rival to Aston Villa? Birmingham City. And is, was anybody in Sabbath a fan of that team? No. Oh, okay. would, the, the band wouldn't have existed if it was. <laughs> I was curious about that. Was, because, like, you know, I'm a big Giants fan, so we don't like the Dallas Cowboys or the Eagles or Washington. So, yeah, I don't know, I don't know much about uh, your type of football, so I didn't know how that rivalry framed oh, no, itself. It's, it's pure hatred. Yeah, well, the, that's, uh, that's how we are in American football, too, with our rivals. So uh, let's, let's say hello to uh, Mike, who's in New York at him in real quick. Go ahead, Mike. Hello, Giza. Thank you for taking my call. I'm a huge fan. I just wanted to ask a question about what was it like working with Ronnie James Dio on the Devil You Know album, and uh, what kind of uh, writing contributions did he make, and what was the process like? Thank you. It was fantastic because we, we wrote, uh, he had a, a studio in his basement, and uh, me and Tony used to go around to his studio with our ideas. And um, it was nice and intimate. The three of us would sit down in the basement with Mike Exeter on the, doing, on the control board. And we'd just discuss what we were going to do. I'd maybe come up with a, a, a riff and Ronnie would uh, go away and think about that, put some lyrics to it and everything. And uh, Tony would do, have a riff. So it was really good. It was really uh, an easy album to write. You know, we talked a little bit about the different singers you worked with in Sabbath and the different periods of, of time and, and, and all that went on. One of the things we didn't touch on was the different drummers. Cause of course, Bill Ward on all the, the classic early stuff, but Vinnie Apice coming in, you as the bass player, you got to lock in with the drummer. Even on the, the Born Again tour, that was Bev Bevan that played, right? On the tour, yeah. Yeah. So how, how, did it, how did you feel about working with some of those different drummers, whether it was Vinnie or Bev or I don't know if you worked with any others in Sabbath, I don't know if Cozy or anybody, but how did how did you uh, how did you lock in with them, and what were the adjustments versus playing with Bill? Um, well, me and Bill, I think we we're totally unique because Bill's got this swing totally. feel to, to his uh, his playing. Yeah. So uh, um, we really grew up together. Uh, Vinny is great, straightforward, uh, great timekeeper, powerful drummer. Um, it was great, you know. I've played with the best drummers, so yeah, yeah. I mean, that's uh, it, so important for you as a bass player to be comfortable and locked in with. Do you remember the very? Vinny told me the very first show he ever played with Sabbath. I think he said was in Hawaii, and he had all the charts written out on paper. <laughs> 
on yeah. his drums, and then a big gust of wind came, and because it was an outdoor <laughs> gig, and blew it all away. Yeah. It was like, he was literally left twisting in the wind. <laughs> we had like two hour, two days rehearsal in L.A. because the promoter in Hawaii, because it was a big football stadium that we were playing. Yeah. The promoter threatened to sue us to death, so we couldn't cancel it. We had two days rehearsal with Vinny, and off to Hawaii, and just hope for the best. What was the most spinal tap moment in, in your career? And, and because some have said there's stuff in spinal tap that was taken from Sabbath and oh, Sabbath experience. Stonehenge thing. <laughs> well, that was for the Born Again tour, right? Yeah. And uh, the tour manager, he wrote the. Because uh, Don Arden managed us at the time. And right. he says, oh, it'd be great to have a Stonehenge backdrop and all this kind of. With the sun rising up as you, gradually as you're playing. And we're going, hey, you're going to have the sun rising up on stage. And um, so he says, yeah, it's got to do the Stonehenge thing. Because one of the tracks is called Stonehenge on the Born Again album. And um, so the tour manager wrote down the, the specs to build the Stonehenge thing. And <laughs> he wrote them in feet, in no, feet. And went to the place that made them. And they did it in meters. <laughs> so it's three, three times Bigger than what it was supposed to be. We couldn't fit it on any stage. <laughs> so you had the reverse issue with Spinal Tap where the Stonehenge was too yeah, big. Yeah. And Spinal Tap was too small. Yeah. <laughs> and in the end, we got to America. And we just had to leave it in the docks in America. <laughs> what did you, when you saw the movie Spinal Tap, did, were you offended by it or did you get a kick out of it? it lovely. It's brilliant. <laughs> okay. I used to play every day on the bus <laughs> on tour. Because there are some musicians that felt it was a little too close to home and was I taking think, the piss too much. I, I think I made and hated it. <laughs> it's timeless. It's the best movie. It still holds up. It's 40 years later. It's incredible. Uh, let me see if I can get one more quick one in. Uh, let's get uh, uh, Dan in Toronto real quick, Dan. Hi, guys. How are you doing today? Good, Dan. Real quick oh, with Dan. your question, Dan. Because I'm almost out of time. Uh, my que uh, yeah, my question is, uh, uh, well, one, honored and a privilege to talk to you, uh, Geese. Um, Thank you, Dan. Electric Funeral Fire, where did that come from? Electric Funeral. It was a bit uh, yes. like what we're going through now, the threat of nuclear war, uh, which was, it was the height of uh, the Cold War going on at the time. And we were, it was like air rate, you got to build your uh, nuclear air raid shelters and all that. So it came about from that. Do you have a favorite Black Sabbath song? No, not really. Do you have a favorite Black Sabbath album? Um, no. Do you ever go listen to your old stuff? Occasionally, but very rarely. Just maybe for, for the, for just to go back in time, or do you listen to it for usually for a reason? Like, I have to I've got prove non, something. I've got non-favorite albums. What's your non-favorite album? Never Say Die. Okay. What about Technical Ecstasy? That was good. I like that. You like oh, that one? Some of them. Was, was that the one with Gypsy on it? I, I think, yeah. That was the worst song I ever wrote. <laughs> <laughs> Never Say Die, least favorite, just because it was unraveling at that time? Yeah. Just yeah. all the problems we had doing it. And... Um, the title it. track is killer on that, though. I love the song, Never Say Die. It's, it's not... The songs aren't that bad. It's just the, the band was, like, in turmoil back then. It was right. just like... Uh, I just, every, any time I hear it, I always think of the horrible things we're going through. Right. All right, well, that music means we're out of time. I can't thank you enough for coming by. Well, thank you, Eddie. I appreciate it. You know where I'm at now, so yep. don't be a stranger. Come sit in any time. You could be my co-host. You're retired. You might want to start a career in radio. Oh, all right, yeah. You could come sit here and just, you know, tell us some stories. I'd, I'd love it. it. My audience would, too. Thank you so much. Seriously, I appreciate it. Thank, Thank you, you for Eddie. coming by. Geezer Butler, everybody. Don't get better than that on Trunk Nation here on a Thursday, live from Vegas. Thank you all for listening.